Welcome everyone. Uh, I can see the participants just joining the room. So uh, my name is Catherine Cronin from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And you're very welcome to today's webinar on creating and sharing open educational resources. Uh, we have three wonderful guest speakers who will be speaking uh, in addition to myself today. Uh, Gerald O'Sullivan from Cork Institute of Technology, Orna Farrell from Dublin City University, and Ian McLaren from National University of Ireland in Galway. Now I think people are still joining the room, but um, I believe our recording is on. And I will go to my next slide here. Uh, I'd like to also say, before I go on to the next slide, Colin Lowry from the National Forum is, uh, is the master behind, behind the webinar today. So he's here, although you won't see him. So thanks very much, Colin. Um, th this is a second slide in the presentation, just to let everyone know that unless otherwise noted, uh, this presentation is lighted, licensed CC BY. We're gonna be talking about all different Creative Commons licenses today. And you'll notice throughout the presentation that there are various resources included in the presentation with other Creative Commons licenses. So this is a good way to let people know that the presentation itself is um, licensed with a CC BY license, um, but you may notice other licensed content um, within it. Um, for the sake of um, all of the people who are here today, you'll know that the default in the chat, I encourage you to use the chat to speak with each other. The default is that you'll be sending a message to all panelists. So please feel free to change that um, at the bottom of your chat window from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. Um, and for those people who are wondering about the recording, the recording will be available tomorrow. Uh, it'll be on the National Forum website and it'll be sent to all people who are participating today. Okay, so um, obviously there's lots of information about OER, but uh, we're, we're really focusing today on creating and sharing OER. So there'll be a short OER overview just now, and then each of the guest speakers will speak in turn about OER that they have created in previous National Forum funded projects, um, which is which will be very interesting because the projects are, are quite different. Um, after their sessions, we'll come back and talk in a little bit more detail about choosing a license once we've seen, uh, you know, a few examples of how people have done this. And finally, there'll be an opportunity for a group Q&A at the end. I'm hoping as well that we'll also have time for a short question and answer sessions after each of the speakers. So you can ask them um, questions um, specifically about their projects. So OER, this is, um, this is an image uh, with a Creative Commons license, Buy and Share Alike by uh, Wikimedia from Germany. Uh, just calling your attention to the license there. Why are we having this uh, webinar today and why is there so much interest? Uh, I see at the moment we have 99 participants here already. One reason, of course, is that, um, is this, is that all projects that are funded by the National Forum, Forum um, all, requires that all resources and materials that are developed must be made available as open educational resources, openly licensed and designed with the potential for future, future adaptation at a local level. Um, and I draw your attention just to that bottom line, particularly because when you're choosing a license, we ask you to think about uh, the fact that people who may use your openly licensed materials may very well want to adapt those materials to suit their own context, their own students, their own course objectives. Um, but there are many, many other reasons for using open educational resources as well. And these are just a few, and particularly in this moment, uh, in the time of COVID-19, uh, institutional closures, uh, the move to online and remote learning, there's very much the, that is to be gained from using open resources that other people have created that can easily be adapted for our own context. So there's a lot of online um, excellent quality material th that's out there. So we want to we'll talk about not only finding and using that material, but also contributing to that commons, if you like, as well. So some of the benefits like for students include reduced costs, if we're talking about um, using open textbooks or OER for, for students for learning, expanded access to learning, where students, may, for example, may not be currently enrolled or um, they will still have access to open educational resources. And even after their students, after they've left our institutions, they remain, those resources remain open to them. Um, the third one there, reusing, updating and enhancing existing learning materials is a key benefit for 
us as people who teach. Um, and Foster's, um, and we can provide many examples of this great partnership and collaboration. Uh, we can engage students as well in co-creating learning materials. It isn't just us that can use and adapt um, teaching and learning resources, but we can engage our students in that process as well. Um, and that brings up the point, obviously, of improving digital skills and digital capabilities through you know, understanding copyright, understanding open licensing, understanding the notion of open. Um, we have a lot of opportunity to diversify the curriculum. For example, if we're using uh, curricula or textbooks that don't include examples that would be relevant for our uh, particular context, we can diversify the curriculum by using OER. We can enhance engagement with cultural heritage collections, which are often available through open licenses. Um, and we can contribute to public knowledge. So yes, it is a requirement of National Forum funded projects, but there are many, many other reasons why um, why using OER um, is a very positive thing to do. So David Wiley uses this description um, of OER that they are teaching and learning resources that you can do these things too. You can retain them, keep your own copies. You can reuse them in your own context. You can revise and remix them, adapt them to your own needs, and you can then redistribute them to share with others. And obviously the nature of the license will determine how readily you can do these five R's, but the five R's is one quick way that people uh, describe what OER are all about. A more formal definition by UNESCO is this one, that OER are teaching, learning, and or research materials in any format or medium, they don't have to be digital, that reside in the public domain or under copyright and have been released under an open license. And that open license and the terms of that open license is what permits not just no cost access, it's not just that they're free, um, but they can be reused, repurposed, uh, adapted and redistributed. So you, you see here again this allusion to the five R's, as Wiley calls them. Uh, a year ago, the National Forum published this very short uh, open licensing toolkit, which just gives four steps uh, to go in and, and, and put an open license on uh, any resource that you create. All of the National Forum's uh, resources around open education can be found at this URL, teachingandlearning.ie forward slash open. And really the focus of today's webinar is going to be on understanding those CC license components and, and choosing the right license for the resources that you're creating. So the way that um, we do that is through the use of Creative Commons licenses, as I said. And these four terms can be mixed and matched. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk about those briefly and then I'll, and then I'll um, pass on to our, to our guest speakers. The first one, by, is attribution. And that's one can be likened really to like what we do for academic referencing. And that means that, you know, I'm going to use this other person's material. I'll use it in my own context. I might change it around, but I must attribute the creator or the licensor. Um, SA, NC, and ND are um, a little, each adds a, a, a restriction. So SA means that you must share with the same license. So it's, it's kind of a commitment to the commons. NC is only for not primarily intended towards commercial advantage or monetary compensation. So you, if you use or create an NC license, you can't charge for access um, to your resource. <clears throat> And also it may be incompatible with other licenses. And ND is used for resources that cannot be adapted or modified in any way, not even translated into another language. So we're really not going to focus on ND licenses today because for educational resources, um, the use of ND is quite rare. Um, because again, it doesn't permit uh, revision, adaptation, translation by the person who's using those resources. So this is a, a list of all the different licenses that you may choose from least restrictive to most restrictive. I'll go into a little more detail about them later, but CC0 alludes to public domain. That means you don't even have to provide an attribution. CC by just tell, give the creator's name, and then you can add different groups of those um, conditions that I talked about. So for educational purposes, we're generally only talking about these four licenses, CC by, CC by share alike, CC by non-commercial, and then CC by NCSA. So a very quick poll um, before our first speaker. Um, and Colin, would you mind sharing the poll? Um, and we're gonna ask each of you, um, ex except for the speakers, um, to answer this question. For the resource that you're thinking about licensing right now, what Creative Commons license are you planning to use? OK, 
Okay, very interesting, quite, quite a range. Okay, nearly everyone. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I think I might just uh, stop the poll now, but that's that. thank you all very much. Um, quite a range and what we're gonna do is run another poll at the end and just see um, maybe how some of the, these um, ideas might remain the same or might have changed. Uh, thanks to our thanks to our guests. Uh, close the window of the poll now, and I'd like to go on to introduce our first guest speaker, um, Giro Los Sullivan's the head of Department of Technology Enhanced Learning at CIT, and uh, a few years ago developed a resource called Tell You, um, for, which is open online resources for teaching with technology. Obviously, something that's very relevant to the sector right now. So I'd like to pass over to you, Gerard, and I'll give you a chance to talk about that. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm going to share my slides, if that's okay. And uh, check that everybody can see these okay in presenter mode. Yes, looks great. Okay, I'm kind of spo spoiling the effect there now by giving you a preview, but anyway, here we go. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'll start by saying, and actually I'll start by, by pressing my timer actually, uh, but I'll start by saying that I did very little work actually on this uh, project and I'm really only reporting on what my colleagues did. So a big shout out to Shane Cronin, to uh, Dara Coakley and to uh, Rojin Garvey, which is alphabetical order only by the way. Um, uh, they're very busy at the moment uh, supporting the Institute uh, in in, I suppose, their remote teaching and learning and assessment uh, efforts, but they may be watching the, the recording subsequently. Um, I've been given some uh, headings to follow, and I will largely follow them, except just for this bit, it just made sense um, for me to talk about the partners first. So this uh, project began, I think, in 2015, ended in 2016. It was led by the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning and CIT and uh, also um, included uh, University College Cork, uh, DIT, which is now part of Dublin Technological University, UCD, and uh, IT Tralee, who you may have heard is now merging with us in Cork to form the uh, Munster Technological University. You heard it here first, or maybe you didn't hear it here first, but you're hearing it now anyway. Uh, right, so the, the, the project overview, what, what was the big idea? Well, I suppose the, the starting point was the idea essentially that um, educators, educationalists, teachers are, are very low on time. They don't have time to dedicate to improving their use of technology in the classroom, to understand what's out there, to uh, find even existing uh, open educational uh, resources. Um, they, while they might be um, quite given, I suppose, to following the recommendations of colleagues, um, they may not be receiving any essentially. So putting something together that provided a way for colleagues to make recommendations or, or offer case studies, we felt might be something that was useful. Um, there is, uh, I suppose, um, real and perceived issues around the reliability of the technology, which can make people uh, reluctant to use it, particularly for high stakes uh, contexts. I should say, by the way, I didn't do these slides either. These are also done by staff. That's, that's why I have such nice slides. Um, and then finally, you know, there may just be a sort of a, a personal barrier or, or negative attitude towards the, use of, uh, towards the use of technology. So we came up with the idea of, uh, of creating a, a platform which would kind of address all of these uh, challenges, the lack of time, the lack of training, the lack of awareness, the lack of recommendation and provide a kind of a whole series of navigable um, resources that uh, everybody could access that would equip them in, in a quick and practical way with what they needed to know to get started with a whole variety of, uh, of different tools and, uh, and, and platforms and link these to the real things that we, uh, that we know that they do or need to do. Um, in terms of what OERs we, we created, essentially we created this website. It's based on uh, based on uh, on WordPress, but we did we did a bit of hacking with it to get it to work um, the way that we want. We have 150 micro learning courses uh, up there, um, and you can navigate through them. You can um, you can search for them. You can follow prescribed pathways through them. They are. Um, 
um, categorized, I suppose, in terms of things like peer learning activities, assessment activities, teacher directed learning activities, student centered learning activities. Uh, you might be listening to that saying, but sure, all of those things will, will merge and blur in all kinds of ways, and they do. So that's the bit in the middle there. Um, some more screenshots there. <clears throat> um, in, in addition to having those, those, uh, all those animations, there's reusable slide decks so that they can be, um, content can be used in class. As I mentioned or hinted at the start, there's use cases that we continue to, to collect. There's a YouTube channel, which almost kind of serves as its own kind of standalone representation of the project or way, way to share the, the outcomes uh, of, the, uh, of the project. Um, okay, in terms of reuse and, and licensing, I'm just keeping my, my eye on the time here. So uh, we've, we've been big on open source for, for a long time, really. We we're very into the whole ideology and, uh, and tradition of the thing. Uh, we uh, shared using, using this license. So I was asked to sort of explain what we did. So it's, uh, it's by NC. So it's, um, it's attribution. So uh, people who reuse it must give uh, credit uh, to us essentially and indicate any changes that were made. Uh, it's non-commercial, so it can't be used for commercial purposes, but otherwise, uh, people are free to copy and redistribute in any medium or format they like, and they're free to adopt or remix or, 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 or transform it. Maybe on second thoughts, we might think again about the non-commercial bit. It might be more restrictive than we had intended it to be. Um, um, and, and, you know, maybe the world has moved on a little bit since we originally chose that, that, that kind of license. Uh, how we told everybody about it? Well, we used our, our voice, we used our networks. Um, the um, ed tech professionals involved in the partner institutes uh, disseminated it across th those institutes and we continued to reach out to uh, people working the ed tech area. Um, uh, the YouTube channel wor worked well as a way to kind of direct people to things and a way for people to kind of stumble along things. Um, we um, promoted it through, through Twitter, uh, obviously, uh, and it had its own kind of hashtag and we leveraged other hashtags to try to get people interested in it. Uh, sometimes we, we tagged in different vendors and, um, and um, uh, got a retweet or something like that from them. We uh, presented at a range of different conferences all over the world as it happened about it, uh, including EdTech here in Ireland and the ALT conference uh, over uh, in the UK. Um, I, I think we, 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 we helped share it or get it out there essentially. So I'll just move something off my screen here. Oops. Um, questions there. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so we, we looked to find people who share our passion for this peer based way of creating things of value. We appealed to the core target audience by providing, we think, high quality, reusable, remixable content at the right level of granularity. That's something I might come back to at the end. And, um, you know, the big tip would be try to create something that people find useful. They'll become invested and involved in the project and they'll, they'll pass on the word. Um, lessons learned, I'm not sure how much time I have left. I have another minute or two, Catherine, I think, do I? Great, okay. So um, I, I don't have slides for this because these are, these, are, these are my words. So um, I think, you know, there used to be advice given when we used to talk about reusable learning objects. I think some of that still holds true. Think about the granularity of what you're sharing. Uh, try to make it relatively uh, self-sufficient. Um, and I would think also try to create things of value. And I mean things that maybe are difficult or expensive to kind of produce or are based on a very kind of specialist kind of an expertise. One of the things we used to say was, the greater the granularity, the higher the reusability. Now our stuff is typically about five minutes long, so it's not the most granular, but it's certainly on the other end of the continuum to you know, a very monolithic kind of self-referential kind of course that's very hard to take and kind of use in, in a different kind of context. Um, I think it did work well for us to invite users to submit uh, to our platform, but you have to be careful and set time aside to uh, to go through everything that was submitted and, and, and ensure that there's uh, that there's quality there. I, I suppose you know. Um, I would consider. I would suggest considering making resources available in a range of different formats. So, 
you know, standards in particular like SCORM and to a certain extent uh, XAPI, you know, they emphasize reusability, but there's an implicit HTML based kind of bias there. And people might find that as useful to have things in a document, in a presentation, or in, in a video, which was our sort of concentration, um, I suppose. The ability to create paths through discrete different learning objects, I think, was something that, that, that served us well and maybe helped us balance, let's say, having things too granular. Excuse me, having things too granular and allowing, um, excuse me, a cough. Uh, and, and allowing um, um, us to be somewhat prescriptive, let's say, or directive about things. Um, I suppose also maybe consider the potential offered by other um, public resources uh, and um, things like YouTube and SlideShare, I think, can be very effective uh, as, as ways to, uh, to share as well. Obviously, your OERs are going to be of limited use if people don't hear about them. So that's the last big tip. Try to get the uh, word out there. I think I'm just about good for time. Thanks, uh, thanks, Catherine. That's fantastic, actually, Gero. Then answered, you know, certainly the, the the questions that we, you know, that we asked in in advance of the presentation. We probably have one minute uh, before the next speaker. I'm wondering if there are any um, questions from from the participants, and I'd be happy to if you want to put them into the chat or use the Q and A feature. Uh, a question here, what were your reasons to choose CC by NC and why add or not share alike? Um, and well, the, the, the last one is the easiest to answer. I suppose we really were keen that people would take the stuff and, and, uh, and remix it as much as possible. Um, if there's any, I wouldn't call it a regret exactly, but if there's anything I might revise, mm -hmm. it's the notion perhaps of making it um, non-commercial. I think perhaps that might have a kind of a stifling effect, which we really hadn't kind of intended. I think we were maybe thinking of mean, nasty, commercially learning companies uh, making money out of, uh, out of the content that had been shared in a very kind of uh, open spirit. But I, I think, Catherine, potentially, you know, it could have unintended consequences. So yeah. that might be the only change I'd make. Maybe that's something okay. that might come up later. That's terrific. And we'll actually kind of come back to that at the end of this presentation about some of the incompatibilities between some of the licenses. So that's, that's terrifically helpful. Thanks, Gero. That was great. Thanks so much. Sure. Okay. Um, just going to advance the slide here to our next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Orna Farrell, Program Chair of DCU Connected Humanities at DCU and a recent and uh, quite a well-known project already, Open Teach, uh, which is CPD for Open Online Educators. So Orna, I might hand over to you. Hi, Catherine, thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you can pop my slide up there for ah. me, that'd be great. It's, it's going back and forth. Look at that. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna, I suppose, speak a little bit about the Open Teach story. Um, so if, for those of you who don't know uh, about Open Teach, it's a uh, Well, and I might funded. ask you just to back up with the slides there. Yeah, to know what's they're, happening. they're going mental. It's going, it's going forwards instead of backwards. Um, well, I'll just talk then. Yes, uh, as we'll he your slide the slide. <laughs> um, so the project is for, uh, forum funded. It's just finished. Uh, so there's still a few things we haven't done yet. So I'll be honest about that. Um, so the aim was to create professional development for online educators, but particularly we were thinking about our own cohort of online teachers who are part time. Uh, they often have other jobs. They are living all over the place as well. So it had to be very flexible. So flexible was kind of key. Um, and openness was 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 very much at the heart of the project. Um, so in terms of our philosophy, the unit I actually work in is called open education. Um, we, we ourselves are very interested in open pedagogy, uh, open textbooks. Uh, so it's an area of interest in terms of research, but also even in terms of our publishing habits, we try to publish open access. Um, so this all kind of fed into this, this ethos in the course, which itself is also open. So it, we, the kind of end product was an open course delivered on an open platform Moodle. 
and open to anyone and everyone. Uh, and we, we got a huge uptake. We had 450 people take the first run of the course and a waiting list of the same number. I had to, I had to stop taking people because I needed a couple of days to do some Moodle setup. Um, so I, I suppose the timing of the course very much uh, coincided with the pandemic. So there suddenly was, you know, a from going from a little bit of interest to huge interest. Um, so the, the details of the website and the Twitter handle are there. You can see a hashtag is actually part of the name of the project. So Twitter was very much uh, in our minds thinking of that. And the hashtag has been used very widely from people sharing their experiences of the course to sharing resources in the area of online teaching. So it's, it's for, performed a number of interesting functions and I've done a little bit of analysis of the Twitter data as well. So Catherine, um, I don't know, do you want to ask me questions? I think we were yeah, wanting to interview. Um, I, sh I should have mentioned when we start that um, Orna and myself decided that we would just have kind of an informal chat rather than, uh, than using a, lo a lot of slides because around these key questions, you used a buy and see license. Mm -hmm. and, um, obviously that was a fairly recent decision because this is a, uh, this is a more recent decision, we'll say, than Gerald's project. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering what kind of conversation you had in the project team about you know, how you came to decide to use that license. Well, I'll be perfectly honest, Catherine, one of our project team members, uh, uh, Katrina Shea, came to the same webinar last year. And following that, we had a discussion, but we also looked through some of the Creative Commons literature and used the license kind of wizard and also consulted with some colleagues who are, are, are strong in this area, like Eamon Costello, and concluded that that was the best. Uh, just to pick up on Garrod's point earlier, yeah, we didn't want the commercial bit because that sounded a bit dirty. Um, <laughs> we wanted the openness and the sharing, but not necessarily for it for someone to be making cash out of it. And in terms of uh, licensing, did you use any openly licensed content in Open Teach? Some. Uh, we mainly made our own content, but we did make use of some video content and some resources from other institutes and remixed. We did. Uh, and we tried to attribute in the correct way as well. But we did create a lot of our own content, uh, which is published on our website mainly, um, a WordPress site, and then all the, we have a YouTube channel. And again, actually very interesting creating the YouTube channel. You have to be very careful about uploading videos that you actually in the YouTube part, get them CC by because the default seems to be uh, not CC by. Um, and I suppose the last kind of pro project we have in terms, it's not actually an official output for the forum, but we'd like to create an open textbook with press books. So I'm just playing around with that at the moment. Um, and I think it's a nice way of sharing the course. You can embed H5P, you can embed most content types there. And again, create a nice open access resource. But the course itself is also available for anyone who wants a copy. There's a form on our website and we'll give you a complete copy of the Moodle course as well. But uh, most of the content from the course is actually on the website, a, a large, a large part. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really helpful. Yeah, I, I saw your note about that because sometimes it's, you know, it's difficult for people to adapt if it's not, if it's, if, if it's shared in a closed format, but you have a statement on the website that says happy to share um, the editable format. So in terms of lessons learned around open, obviously you had a team that knew quite a bit about open already, as you said, um, through this process of both using open resources and creating this as an open resource, you know, are there any key lessons learned that you'd like to share? Well, I have to say, out of the people in the team, I pro like I, I've always liked the philosophy of openness, but I think some of the nitty gritty of the licensing and the sharing and some of the language is quite complex. Um, so I, I found it took me a little while to get my head around it. Um, but I, I think uh, the key lesson, I suppose, is get a bit of advice about the licensing. I actually found the CC BY website and their tools very good very straightforward um, and just watch out for things like that on YouTube where they're trying to default to into other licenses um, and, and use your network. I mean, I, pub I put something out on Twitter a while ago about when I was trying to explore open textbooks 
Um, you know, did anyone have any suggestions or recommendations? And I got lots and lots of really good answers. And I ended up getting into a Rebus, who are a community in Canada, interested in open text, into, into a special scheme they're running for the pandemic, uh, getting a free uh, Pressbooks EDU license and getting their support. So that was fantastic. So I, I think use the network would be my key piece of advice. Okay, that's super. That's very good advice. Uh, I'm just looking at the Q&A here. And again, another a, a question from John Stowe about why did you opt not to use a share alike license essay? Gosh, I, I actually, I, I, I don't really know is the, is the answer. Sorry, Catherine. Uh, as I said, I should know more about this licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I, I think that the consensus in the team was that CC BY was the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should have had more dialogue about other options. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the purpose of today. And, you know, I, I, I've, you know, all, all of you and myself included, and many of our participants have been involved in, in licensing for, for some time. And, uh, you know, I'm still learning all the time. So, you know, you just le you learn by doing this. Uh, and that's why we, we wanted to get your, your take. Um, it's a terrific resource. So thank you very much for sharing and talking about it. Um, there's, there's some good resources being shared in the chat. And I might just ask uh, Colin if you would mind sharing the link um, again from the beginning. The, the, there's a bit.ly link to this the, the presentation and some resources because you mentioned Rebus or Orna. And yeah, shared some resources. fantastic. Yeah, I shared some resources from Rebus and from Creative Commons and others. Uh, in that document. And Pressbook itself is a fantastic uh, resource too, but the only thing is if you go for the, the kind of free version, you cannot embed H5P, um, right. which, was a, which was a problem because some of our content is in H5P and, I really and I, in a really nice way, mm. um, which is also a lovely open access resource or tool as well, H5P, uh, and integrates really nicely with Moodle as well. Yeah, there, so you bring up a great point. There's so many considerations when it comes to choosing a license and, and this is really important. So, okay, thank you so much once again. Uh, I might trickle over to my slides once again uh, and introduce our final speaker, uh, Dr. Ian McLaren. Ian is head of CELT uh, at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, I was at NUI Galway for 18 years, so I know Ian quite well. Uh, and um, Ian, delighted that you could join us today and you're gonna talk about All Aboard. So I will hand over to you, I'll put up your slide here. And as with Orna, um, we've invited Ian just to talk about this and I might just ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to the group for questions. Thanks Ian. Thanks very much, uh, nice to uh, see you all here. Um, yeah, I mean, basically the All Aboard project, um, which uh, started quite some time ago, uh, the aim of All Aboard was to try and produce uh, self-study materials that students or staff in higher education could use to improve their confidence in using digital technologies, whether they're for teaching or for learning. So we saw that our main audience was either students or staff. Uh, and we tried to write the materials uh, in, a, in a way that could be, you know, um, used by both groups. We came on the idea fairly early on in the project of trying to um, make sense of the digital landscape, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and we came up with this, this metro map, which I, <laughs> I've seen a million times now, but um, it, it, it really helped us uh, in the project in trying to make sense of all the different kinds of skills and knowledge that people need to have in order to flourish in the digital age, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and so the metro map there was, was a, a really powerful metaphor, both for the project team and for, for other people that we worked with. And we had lots of interest in the project just because of the metro map metaphor itself Self, and uh, a number of people contacted us to, to want to translate it into other languages. So the map really just has a number of lines uh, that correspond to different ways in which you might think about teaching or learning. But the, the, the bulk of the kind of um, open materials was really in the online lessons. So in many of those metro stations, um, we actually created a page similar to the one that we can see here on this slide. Uh, so this is one of our stations or one of our uh, lessons. It's called Tools for Learning. That's just a, a random example I picked. And if you go to the, the page on the website, 
then you can click there where it says interactive lesson in the graphic at the top right hand and uh, it will take you on an interactive lesson. Um, so we produced these using different platforms, uh, different, uh, sorry, software, so mainly Articulate Rise, but also um, Articulate Storyline in, in large part. Uh, and from the very outset, we wanted these to be open and as shareable as possible. So not only do we make the interactive lessons there available, but we also provide SCORM packages that anyone can download uh, and edit or put into their own learning management system or do whatever they want with. <laughs> um, part of the project too was, was connecting this to a badging platform. So we also felt that if people worked through the lessons and uh, did little quizzes and interactions, then they should be awarded a digital badge in recognition of their achievement. So most of our lessons are connected to digital badges, which are, as I say, produced uh, on the basis of, of completing the lesson. Um, but the, the project team was a, a collaboration between people in NUI Galway, UCD, UL and Mary I. Um, but we were very um, in much in agreement at the beginning that what we wanted to do was have a kind of fairly neutral brand that anybody could um, use uh, and to kind of hide in a way the institutional branding and logos and all that sort of thing. Put that by all means into the, the, um, the acknowledgements sections of all of our lessons but but pull back a little bit because we wanted people to understand that we were doing this for the wider uh, educational community and it wasn't just a project mm -hmm. with this particular consortium because we've had experience in the past where quite often uh, institutions will produce open materials but they'll plaster them with their institutional logos uh, and we know that that sometimes puts people off using them so we thought look let's just forget about that make sure everybody's absolutely acknowledged of course but but come up with a kind of graphical style and a design that isn't tied to any of our particular institutions. Uh, so we thought that was quite an important aspect of it too. Um, in terms of the licenses, it is a really good question to explore what's the most appropriate license. Uh, and and we're, we've got a slightly complicated answer and I'm sorry about that. Um, in that our main license that we used was just as we've seen before at BYNC. But in some of the lessons, we've had to use different licenses. And that's because one of the things that we really wanted to do in the project was to show people that it's great to remix. <laughs> you know, that there is lots of useful material out there and you don't have to reinvent things. But we've often found in, in projects that people are still a little bit reluctant to, to use other people's work as well, even if it's licensed. So we did actually take materials from other providers uh, under their license considerations. And if they had another license, we had to correspond to that. So for example, if some of them put share alike for those lessons using that material, we had to use share alike. Does that make sense? So when you're using the licenses, you do have to pay attention, not just to the materials that you are yourself producing, but the materials that you might be using as part of the content. And that's one of the more subtle and, tr and tricky things. You need to make sure that your product is allowed, it, a derivative is allowed um, from the, the, the other sources. And also if you've got share alike, it must be shared alike. So if you go through the site, you'll find our, our lessons and our materials, and there will be a few of them that will have slightly different licenses. And that's the rationale for it. So, that's really interesting, Ian. That that's a that's a key lesson learned. You know, understanding the compatibilities yeah. Yeah. With, with the different licenses, thinking not only of how you want your work to go out there, but how you can share work that others have done once you've remixed it and reused it. Um, do you, because it is all openly licensed and you've shared it so widely, uh, do you what knowledge do you have about how and where uh, the All Aboard resources have been reused? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, we've, we've had lots of, in, had lots of interesting stories. People have contacted us um, and told us how they're using them. I mean, obviously we can do statistics on the website and so forth and get an idea. But um, what we wanted to do was make sure this was as flexible and open as possible. So we didn't want to create a website where people, the first thing they had to do was register. Uh, we said, no, we'll just let people go straight to the resources and they can do what they want with them. 
Um, now, of course, that means you, you don't have a big record of all the people who've, but, but we just thought that was too much of a barrier. We just wanted to make it freely available. Um, but we do know the materials have been used uh, in lots of different places. Uh, people have used them as is, and many have uh, adapted them. Uh, people have written to us and asked for uh, some guidance and s support and asking for permissions when they didn't need to ask, but it was nice of them to do so. And um, we've seen the, the, the idea and the Metro map really spread. I mentioned it was translated into a number of different languages in other countries. It's also the case with some of the lessons as well. Some of the lessons have been embedded within um, universities' um, induction process orientation, you know, early training for, for new students um, initiatives. So we've seen, we've seen that. We can also track, in a sense, from the badges. Um, you, you, you have to click to say whether you want to receive the badge or not. And that is a form of you know, acknowledgement and, and uh, so we can see the badges have spread quite widely. Uh, and we've also been invited to, to give presentations. Uh, and I remember one, once being really surprised, but delighted that we got invited to speak at the ministerial summit uh, of the OECD in Cancun. Um, I found it very difficult to resist the temptation to go there. Um, that's in the days when we could travel. But that was an amazing experience. And that's where we got invited to talk about our approach to digital skills, talk about the Metro map and talk about the lessons on digital badging. And it received a, a very different audience to the one that we would normally be dealing with, which would be academics, I suppose, uh, in other universities. Uh, and we've also spoken in a number of other fora as well that we've been invited to, including some employers uh, associations. Uh, we got an invitation to the German Employers Federation uh, to talk as well about this idea of, of, of micro lessons and, and micro credentials. So it's been it's been a really pleasant surprise to see um, how uh, widespread the uptake has been. Oh, sorry about that. All right. Um... The, yeah, I, I, I'll just wait for the slides for a second. Um, it, it's, it's very jumpy today. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that that notion, there's a little bit in the chat just about that notion of trying to avoid institutional branding. You know, it, it facilitates reuse if you don't do that. And we, we actually do use um, the All Aboard project as an example in the National Forum Open Licensing Toolkit of, of how to um, attribute to a project name. And then mm. on your About tab, you have the institution names and even some individuals names, you know, who were yeah. instrumental in putting that work together. So, you know, yeah. it is possible to, to credit yeah. all of the people who are involved, but have the actual attribution go to the project name. And you have been very visible on Twitter and that I still often see it, you know, shared, <laughs> shared quite a bit on Twitter. Um, there's another question uh, in the chat here about uh, from Inez about what technology did you use to build the website? Our website, um, the All Aboard website, All aboard, is, yeah. is just, um, we're just using WordPress there. I think I mentioned in an earlier comment that we just use Divi uh, as the kind of tool for um, layout. There's lots of these kind of tools you can get, but it's, it's, it's the, the actual website itself is just a, a WordPress site. Um, the lessons themselves, as I said, were made using uh, a variety of different uh, tools because it, we, we, we had people contributing as the project went on. Um, so, but mainly we used Articulate Storyline at first and then started using Articulate Rise uh, and also one or two using Nobly. So if anybody knows those tools, those were the tools for the, the actual lessons themselves. The badges, uh, we use Open Badge uh, Platform, uh, Open Badge Factory, sorry, as our badge platform. Okay. Uh, any final questions for Ian before we go on? And I'm just going to add this, um... The, the link to uh, a Bitly page, which has links to all of um, the projects that are that have been mentioned this morning, um, as well as some additional resources from Creative Commons and, and, and Open Licensing. Okay, all right, Ian, I want to thank you very much. There will uh, I just want to wrap up with a few points, and then we'll open it to kind of a, a more wide ranging Q and A, not necessarily about the individual projects, but just about licensing and reuse and so on. But I want to thank you all. It's really yeah, it really illuminates this to to talk about actual projects and actual decisions uh, about reuse and sharing. So thank you all very much. Okay, um, let's try that slide advancing again. <laughs> Maybe it's my touchpad. <laughs> okay. Um, the, to, to wrap up, I just want to make a few 
points and maybe you know allude back to some of what Gerud and Orna and Ian were saying uh, and thinking about licensing, this is the, the image that I shared before, kind of going from least restrictive to most restrictive license. So as you can see from what everyone mentioned, the National Forum uses a CC BY license for what we share, uh, it's kind of as a national body, publicly funded, that's our commitment uh, to do that. And the, the three projects that were shared this morning used a CC BY NC license. Um, other bodies use different licenses, so a lot of the kind of public cultural heritage, some examples there, Rijks Museum, Paris Musée, Smithsonian Hunt Museum in Limerick, the Wellcome Trust, um, use mostly public domain licenses, and this is, there's, you know, almost every uh, week, if you pay attention to this kind of thing, you read about another museum uh, in another location that's committed to sharing their collections via like a public domain license or a CC BY license. Um, and this gives us, um, as, as those who teach and those who learn, a huge trove of, of information that we can use in our own teaching and learning materials. So it's good to be aware of that. Um, Wikipedia and Wikimedia use a CC by share alike license. And again, this is Wikipedia and Wikimedia's commitment to the commons. Another name for the share alike license is copyleft. Uh, in response to uh, you know copyright, um, so anything uh, that's shared on Wikipedia um, or that's used on Wikipedia must be available under a less restrictive license. So Wikipedia, for example, can't use anything that's NC licensed. Um, uh, but again, and anything that you use from Wikipedia must be shared alike. Um, I could have added many other things here. Um, the European Union committed to making all of its publications and reports available using uh, a CC0 or CC BY license that just happened in 2019. Um, and I linked all of these. So if you look at the slides, you, these links are to the pages where you can find out more information uh, about how these different bodies you know, communicated their reasons for choosing various licenses. And again, I could add many more things here, but the yellow box really contains the licenses that are most often used for teaching and learning resources. And those are really what, um, what we wanted to focus on today. So um, particularly for people who are thinking about licensing something uh, now, these are just some things to consider. And you know, many of them have already been mentioned by our guest speakers this morning. But the key thing is to think of yourself as a creator and think of yourself also as a potential of user, user of the resources that you're putting out there. So as a creator, uh, think about the content of your resource. What is the level? Is it, is it, a very, is it something that might be applicable to many people? Uh, or are there some sensitivities around the content which might um, uh, make you choose a, a more restrictive license, for example? Think about the granularity, as Geroth said. So smaller, more granular resources are much more, uh, much more easily adopted and used within resources that people are creating, you know, for their students or for their learning communities. So things like infographics, assignments, images, and so on. But perhaps it's something larger like a textbook or a course, in which case you may choose another license. You can, of course, as Ian said, also think about licensing a collection of resources that are licensed differently within that to facilitate sharing. Think about the media. Is it text, image, video, sound, animations, or other? Um, text is, is, it's advisable really to share usually under CC BY license just to make it as easy as possible for people to reuse. Uh, and the other media might, you might choose to, um, to license or share differently. And think about the digital formats, um, as I think has already been mentioned. But think of yourself also as a potential user of the resources that you're creating. So are you going to permit modification, translation, and remix? The definition of OER says that that, that is required. So that's why we don't advise use of a non-derivatives license because it doesn't permit any of those things. Will you permit commercial use if someone were to charge for a resource that had some of your materials in it? Will you require others to share alike? And a fourth bullet that I can add there and will be in the resource that we publish based on all of this is think about the um, the compatibility issues between licenses. So a choice of a license, as has already been mentioned, may preclude other people from using your creation. So what I'm going to do is share two um, charts that are remixes of Creative Commons charts uh, that we've created for the purposes of, uh, of sharing open educational resources within higher education in Ireland. Um, these have been reviewed by Jenren Wetzler, who was our guest speaker. Uh, for the webinar last year and by some other colleagues. 
Um, and as I said, all of the materials and, and information shared in today's webinar is going to be in a new resource published in June, which will be a follow on to our open licensing toolkit. But there are two charts here. The first is um, compatibility between licenses if you want to include something in your OER that you're creating without modifying, translating, or remixing it. So let's think, uh, if you look down the column right in the middle there that says CC by NC at the top, you know, we, talk, we, we, we heard um, explanations from three CC by NC projects this morning. If you're creating one of those projects, you can use um, open resources licensed in, in, any, in any of the other licenses if you don't change them whatsoever. So I could use um, a CC by SA photograph in my CC by NC collection, only if I don't touch that photograph at all. I don't alter it, I don't crop it, I don't change it in any way. You can see the red boxes there, kind of using the traffic light system, NC licensed material. So now think of your NC licensed material going out in the world. So look at the row that says CC by NC. Who can use your CC by NC material in their collections? Well, uh, if it was a public domain licensed uh, collection, column one, column two, a CC BY collection, column three, a CC BY share alike collection, they could not use your material, uh, even in a collection where they weren't altering it in any way because you've chosen a CC BY NC license. So this is the notion of um, license compatibility that we need to be aware of. The second chart is a little more complex, and this is asking the question of, you know, can I include this OER in my own if I want to alter it in some way, if I want to remix it? So again, traffic light system, green is yes, red is no, and yellow is you know, yes, maybe, if you, you know, only under some circumstances. So look at the bottom two rows. Um, those are the ND licenses. ND means no derivative. So if you're creating something and you want to remix material, you cannot remix any material with an ND license. So those are out, first of all. And the two gray columns on the right, we're not advising you to create ND licenses. It can be by an exception basis, but we're not talking about it this morning. So let's think about the National Forum, for example. We create our resources using CC BY. So look at the second column there. What material could I use in a CC BY publication, or even this presentation this morning, which is lesson CC BY? I can use um, and remix public domain um, OER. I can remix CC BY licensed OER. CC BY SA, CC BY NC, CC BY NCSA, those three yellow boxes. I can remix those materials, um, but only if I then use the more restrictive license where the arrow is pointing. Um, so, um, and then I obviously I can't use no derivative material. Um, as, as I'm just looking at Neve's comment there, NC doesn't have to be anti-commercial. Absolutely, the, the actual definition of NC is not primarily intended or directed towards commercial advantage or monetary compensation. So, um, so re really, really great point there, Neve. Um, so if I just flip back to the previous chart using the, the National Forum example, um, I can use um, a, a photograph licensed CC by SA um, in my CC by material um, if I don't change it. But if I want to remix it, I really can't do that. I'd have to use the more restrictive license. And I think Ian's explanation of why they licensed some of the all aboard lessons differently was precisely um, because of this. So I mean, the, these charts, um, uh, I provide the attributions, the full attributions for where I got the information from these charts in the, the notes for this session, which I've shared on the bit.ly link. Um, these charts are best used if you're sitting down and really kind of pouring over them, but I just wanted to bring up a few examples that there are many things to think about when we're creating resources, not for openly licensing, just in the normal course of our teaching. We would think, you know, obviously of our students, our, you know, the learning community where we are and what the normal practice is and, and design our materials for our students. When we assign an open license, we're asking you to think a little bit more broadly. So who might use these materials elsewhere in the Irish higher education community or beyond? And what could I do to facilitate um, that reuse? And that's really, um, you know, kind of the set of considerations that we invite you to think about. It is complicated. Uh, I've pointed to a lot of documents which, which provide more information. The CC licensing, or sorry, the open licensing toolkit is available for you. And as I said, we'll have a follow on 
publication by the end of June. Um, I'm going to just do one more poll and then we have um, kind of about six minutes left for, for questions. So Colin, would you mind just sharing the poll again? Um, uh, CC by, CC by SA, CC by NC, CC by NCSA, other, if you're thinking of doing collection like Ian talked about, you could put that under other um, and just see what people are thinking about. Okay, very interesting. Um, the, the range of teaching and learning resources, certainly amongst the SATL projects, uh, let alone any, any other resources that I might not be aware of, is enormous in terms of discipline, in terms of the, you know, the type of content, in terms of the audience. So we recognize that different licenses may be required. So obviously there's information in the, in the open licensing toolkit, there's the information provided today. Um, but I just want to say on behalf of the National Forum that we're, we're happy to be, to have a dialogue, a conversation, you know, if you have questions about licensing your particular resource. But for the moment, I think I might just open up for questions and um, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the chat completely. Uh, but I'll look at the Q&A and the chat and Orna, uh, Gabriel, Ian and myself will be happy to, uh, to answer any questions people may have. Yeah, Gabriel, you're asking if potential users might still be put off by NC. <laughs> yeah, are you, so were you, we're having, are you we responding were to something in the chat there? We were having a bit of a discussion in the chat there. So um, Ian and uh, Neve Brennan had some had some um, great clarifications there. I think around the uh, the non-commercial, and I was wondering. Um, you know, would NC still potentially put off um, certain uses of your content? So that was something I was referring to earlier. So mm -hmm. I guess originally maybe when we, you know, decided to put that on, on our license, we were perhaps thinking of, uh, you know, big fat corporations <laughs> making, making money off the sweat of our brows. But mm -hmm. I, I think it could have a stifling effect um, at the same time. And it isn't necessarily a stifling effect that it might have on, on commercial companies even. You could think of, uh, um, you know, uh, non-governmental organizations, for example, or um, um, I suppose just about anyone who works in that kind of um, um, blurry bit, let's say, between public sector and, and, and private, which, which a lot of us do, by the way. Indeed. And um, I think this notion about the license incompatibility, I'm just sharing that chart there again, is just shows an example of how the NC license can sometimes have unintended consequences. And that's the way, you know, a lot of open advocates talk about it, that many people focus on the non-commercial piece, but it has other consequences as well. Um, and I, I did go read your point there, Neve. Um, the, it's an important point to be made. The, the Creative Commons license doesn't change anything about the, the rights to copyright. And I included a great article by Owen O'Dell in, in the resources for today about you know, using, using copyrighted material for Irish online education. So Creative Commons doesn't change that. It's a layer on top of that. And of course you can ask permission. So Creative Commons is really just trying to facilitate the most frictionless sharing possible. Um, so uh, another, is there another question here? I understand some people are leaving. In the case of the All Aboard project, Michael Costello asks, did the digital badges prove to be a popular incentive for students it, to engage with the various modules? I was actually trying to type an answer in there, but maybe it's okay. just, for just to, see, just to see it. Actually, um, the thing about digital badges is that some people don't like the, the terminology. They don't like badges, especially among some of the academic staff that we were also working with. They would uh, think that was very, um, you know, no, no, you know, it, it sounded too trivial. So actually all we were doing was we just, if people completed the lesson, they got the offer, the option to, to collect a badge. 
Uh, and so it was a kind of a soft launching of the idea of badges, if you want to put it that way. So it w yes, it could potentially incentivize some people, some students might want to collect them or whatever, but we also thought it would pull off a lot of people if we you know, headlined the badging aspect. The badging is a mechanism for recording people's own personal achievement. So we just used it in that way. So that people would do the lesson, they get the badge and think, oh, what's this? <laughs> and after a while, we saw that people started wanting to collect more to get the full set. Um, mm -hmm. but, we, but we deliberately, in a sense, kind of put it in the background, if you see what I mean, because we thought it would put off people, uh, some people that we were aiming mm -hmm. to get. Uh, and it is interesting because once they actually receive a badge for work that they've done, they get the idea of what the badge yes. is and how useful it is. Um, so. Okay. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, I, uh, one more question that I'll answer, which is will we get a chat export? The, um, the recording with the chat will go to all the participants uh, by email, but also tomorrow, just the recording of the actual webinar will go on the National Forum website without the chat, you know, because that's a more public uh, forum. But, um, I saw most of what was in the chat, but not all of it. So thanks, Gerard, for pointing that out, that there was a lot of interesting um, information posted in the chat. Um, I'm aware that it's 12 o'clock and I don't want to um, take any more time. Obviously, we could talk about this for hours more and I'm happy to engage in more conversation, but I really just uh, will say that happy to take the conversation forward with anybody one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Please feel free to contact our wonderful guest speakers. And I want to thank again, Gerald O'Sullivan, Orna Farrell, and Ian McLaren. Um, terrific to have your stories to really illuminate this this morning. Um, and my illustration here is just from a, from a public culture collection, the New York Public Library, because that's where I'm from. This lovely uh, woodcut image of Nijinsky, just to illustrate how uh, a lot of our public domain coll collections provide resources that can be really um, interesting and useful for teaching and learning. So best of luck to everyone. Please continue the conversation afterwards and I wish you all the very best of luck. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. <laughs>